few rather tart words for the militia that was supposed to come rescue them and got within a few yards and then decided they couldn't cross the river even though the whole Indian party she was with, including, um, and, as she put it, women, uh, children, and the lame, um, managed to cross without any trouble. Uh, Hannah Dustin, who was uh, abducted from her home um, uh, having just given birth to her 12th child, um, was abducted. Uh, as she was being abducted, her husband ran in the door and then promptly ran out again. Um, and she announced how she freed herself by killing uh, 10 Indians, and also scalping 10 Indians uh, so that she could get the bounty. Uh, these were the kind of accounts that got rewritten and rewritten until male shame had been turned into an exaggerated ironclad male valor um, and female strength um, was denounced uh, and replaced with an exaggerated helplessness. Um, Hannah Dustin is a, a classic case in point. There were a whole bunch of literary luminaries who went after her in the 19th century. You know, long, this is Nathaniel Hawthorne most famously uh, turned Hannah Dustin's husband Nathaniel Hawthorne most famously uh, turned Hannah Dustin's husband Thomas uh, into a mighty hero on horseback um, based on only his own fever imagination. There's no evidence of that. Um, and turned Hannah into what Hawthorne called a bloody old hag who should be expunged from the history books. Um, the women who weren't turned into hags were turned into frail creatures um, in danger of rape unless they were rescued. It's in this way that we ended up with uh, Natty Bumpo and Last of the Mohicans, Buffalo Bill, uh, and all those dime store cowboy heroes um, rescuing helpless young women. Uh, all the way down to the modern era of movies, uh, to Birth of a Nation with the uh, in Knight Riders rescuing the uh, virginal, you know, white southern maidenhood, um, to John Wayne saving little Debbie in the 1956 western classic The Searchers, uh, to Tom Cruise uh, in uh, saving his daughter from both Martian attack and uh, molester attack. Um, in Spielberg's uh, film War of the Worlds, which was very much informed by 9-11, as those of you who have seen it know. Um, the point is, this is a general myth of, of a national character, um, but because of its origins, it relies on a gender formula. Um, it relies on a formula based on, on male and female roles. Um, the formula goes, the nation is strong because its men are brave and capable protectors, uh, but men can't be shown to be brave and capable unless the women are weak and in need of a male savior. So all that said, let me uh, finally return us to September 11. On that day, you could say that we suffered two attacks a physical attack that destroyed buildings and people, and a symbolic attack that shattered our myth of American invincibility. In response, we deployed um, some rather heavy artillery to repair the myth. Now, how did we do this? By using a trumped-up domestic drama to paper over our vulnerability. Uh, this expressed itself in, in a variety of ways, uh, some of which are exceedingly frivolous and silly. Uh, other ways were important and dangerous. So le let me start with a silly and we'll go from there. Um, look at some of the messages we got after September 11. Uh, by the end of October 11, uh, I counted four articles in the New York Times alone uh, that claimed that the attacks were causing single career women to repent their independence and rush to the wedding altar. Uh, one of these articles actually advised women um, that they should take as their model the Twin Towers, which uh, the Times explained uh, were like a Mr. and Mrs. A quote, long married couple caught up in a 30-year romance. 
Uh, <laughs> exactly. What? <laughs> That's what I said. Um, single women who did not get married, uh, the Times said, would be seen as, quote, out of sync with the country's renewed sense of purpose, quote, small-minded and, quote, unpatriotic. Now, you can see this sort of weird line forming all over the media. Uh, newspapers and news weeklies predicted that 9-11 would take a deep mental toll on the unmarried because they'd have no one to call if their plane was hijacked. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure would be the first thing on your mind if your plane was hijacked. Um, CBS's The Early Show summoned uh, unwed women to the set and asked them to talk about, quote, the void you must now feel. Even uh, the, the tabloid The Star published a special post 9 11 issue with Hollywood celebrities. Um, berating themselves for failing to commit sufficiently to family life. 9-11 was also supposedly driving women to the nursery. Uh, the press claimed that the attack had set off women's biological clocks, uh, <laughs> that there would be a big baby boom uh, nine months hence, uh, which by the way never materialized, um, and having babies was now women's, quote, patriotic duty. Uh, women were also said to be responding to 9-11 by returning to homemaking. Uh, the LA Times said that the shock of the attacks was, quote, pushing some of the country's best prepared career women towards stay-at-home motherhood. Time magazine predicted that women would stock up on meatloaf pans and sewing machines. <laughs> Stay home, the magazine said. Sew your own drapes and dresses. TV programmers announced that in 2002, the new shows for the, quote, post 9-11 inspired season uh, would be dramas about, guess what, women returning to the home. And the fashion industry promoted what it called crisis couture, <laughs> uh, which would be all about, they said, chiffon, baby doll dresses, and white lace. This may be one of the reasons why there are still all these baby doll outfits in the, in the stores, as any of you have tried to find a normal shirt, well, <laughs> acknowledge. Um, women, Vogue magazine told us, would now want outfits that were, quote, distinctively non-aggressive and no longer, quote, about dominance and power. Now, there was a tremendous amount of this silliness, but it also had a serious side. Uh, right after the attacks, there were an alarming number of articles and commentaries accusing women, uh, specifically feminists, of weakening our, uh, our military, undermining our resolve to fight, uh, e and exhibiting traitorous behavior. You know, I actually, I just clipped from the paper, and you probably all have seen this, it was in Maureen Dowd's column about, um, this is just two days ago, uh, David Horowitz's you know, conservative Freedom Center, uh, urging college students to stage sit-ins outside the offices of women's studies departments to protest, quote, the silence of feminists over the oppression of women in Islam, which um, is kind of astounding when you think um, feminists uh, in America, particularly the feminist majority, were really the only ones speaking up about the Taliban in, um, years before you know, it ever registered on anyone's radar. Um, and after 9-11, many feminist critics uh, were from Katha Paula to uh, the novelist uh, Barbara Kingsolver to, of course, you know, Susan Sontag, uh, were vilified um, for raising their voice in even the most um, uh, tempered ways and vilified in extremely ugly fashion. Uh, more generally, women's voices began disappearing from op-ed pages and news uh, uh, talk shows right after 9-11. Um, in the first seven weeks following the attacks, the number of female guests on the Sunday morning news programs shrank by 40 percent. Even women who were heads of congressional subcommittees dealing with terrorism, like uh, Senators Feinstein and Boxer, uh, made no appearances on these shows. Now, 
So while women were being shrunk, uh, men were being inflated. Uh, in particular, our male political leaders uh, were being inflated and reimagined as superheroes and power lifters. Uh, the media called Bush uh, approvingly our Lone Ranger, that was on the cover of, I think it was Time, um, Top Gun, Superman, Bullet Man, and America's Dragon Slayer. Newsweek applauded Bush and said we should all feel um, uh, more secure because uh